Peter, give up Intel and open a bar in my truck. <laughs> so if you get hungry, they also serve food. And it's quite yummy, right? It's not bad. So if you start getting peckish in the middle of this interview, then you can, you can talk to these two ladies, right? And they'll order food for you. I'm not going to say what it says because it makes me feel hungry. Uh, deep fried spare ribs. So, uh, this is quite hard because it's usually used for pole dancing. So, we've specially brought you a pole dancer. Woo! Two pole dancers for the price of one. And they're going to say a few words about the or the event formerly known as SES. If anybody can tell me what it's currently called, I give you a free drink coupon. If I can find a way to call. Right, come on. Come on, something that they haven't talked to. What is the event formerly known as SES now called? You may talk to you. And you're a sheep, Max. So anybody know what it's called? Oh, yeah. Over here. Live. Yeah, no, you're you're on the board. The That's two two. Max gets it. Max gets it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I'll tell you a little bit about this event. Go, it's all yours, ladies. The floor's yours. Thanks, Napoleon. Hi, everyone. My name's Emma Jane. I am the senior program manager for Click C Live. This is my colleague Annie, who looks after the marketing for our events. Um, so we're here today just to let you know when the event is happening and what it's about. So book the date. The 6th and 7th of August, it's at the Kowloon, uh, the Mira Hotel in Kowloon. Um, and the conference is all about online marketing. So we have some of the most influential experts from leading brands and service providers in and around Asia coming to talk about how they can you help. You've got some names, <laughs> got some names. I can, so we've got Facebook, we've got eBay, we've got HTC, mm. uh, Johnson & Johnson, Ocean Park, uh, Mediacom, Cisco, anyone else? Uh, Are you still looking for speakers? I have yeah, one or yeah. two speaking slots remaining. Anyone here who's good at speaking? speaking? <laughs> Just one or two. He's got his own YouTube channel. <laughs> come, 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 come and talk to me, come and talk to me. Um, so the theme for our conference this year is borderless commerce and the ability to communicate with your customers anytime and anywhere. Wow, that's topical. Isn't it, Jess? <laughs> So, um, wow. yeah, so we have tracks involving mobile marketing, social media, e-commerce, customer engagement, anything you want to know about online marketing, we have it. So, um, do come and give me your business card or drop your business card into the bowl at the front. Yeah, the plastic bucket at the front. There's a the plastic door. bucket at the front because that is how classy we are. <laughs> <laughs> Drop your business card. Yeah, you're classy, that's me. <laughs> Drop your business card into that bowl. Um, after the speech here this evening, we will be picking out two business cards from the bowl, and those two lucky names on those business cards will receive complimentary tickets to attend the event on the 6th and 7th of August. So remember to... And how much are those tickets worth? Annie. Obviously worth a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, they're worth a fortune. So if you want to get a discount off a of fortune, what are we going to do? There's a special okay, website, so right? As you guys obviously all know the Wednesdays, um, you're all entitled to 25% off the standard rate. So um, as EJ mentioned, the conference runs 6 and 7, so you get 25% off that. Um, so the standard rate is 1899. So, work it out. Work it out. Work it out. Can't do it on the spot. If you could tell me, what's 25% off 1899 you get a free drink? 144. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I'm done. laughs> okay. um, so yeah, I, Napoleon, I think, is going to distribute the, the link that you guys... Yeah, it'll be on the Wednesday uh, Facebook group, not page. Right. I don't like Facebook because they don't allow me to merge them. We've got Facebook. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Round of applause. Thank you. Brilliant. So, I also have to thank... There's a guy that's hidden in the... Where's he gone? Ron! Uh, the guy that's hidden in the booth there works for a company called Radio Chinwag. He's very good with sound. He's not very good at talking, but he's very good at editing. So, Radio Chinwag, if you need to sort anything out to do with sound, talk to that man.
Uh, and also Bronnie, where are you? Bronnie. Bronnie, we used to work together in PR, we both decided that it was a complete fucking nightmare. So he set up his own photography company called Bronnie.com. B-R-O-N-N-E-Y.com. He's a brilliant photographer. Almost as good as... <laughs> where is he? Victor. Victor, where are you? Victor. Yes. The guy that looks like an SAS soldier, actually he also does photography, but... He's about to open a nightclub. Where's your nightclub? Not here. Not here, okay, cool. That was really good advertising, man. Eh? Okay, so let's get started. Um, we've got a few things going on here before the speaker comes up. We're gonna, we've got a few more free drinks. He's very generously sponsored a second drink, or more drinks. So halfway through when you're looking at it parched, uh, or if you ask a good question, or if you heckle really well, without swearing, in English or Cantonese, or even Mandarin, we might give you a drink. And then, because he sells uh, designer glasses, yeah. David, you can come and talk about these. So, uh, we come on, come on, in the curtains, stay in the curtains, get behind the seat. I want a big round of applause for CEO of Smart Eye Glasses, David Manning, the business side of the Before you sit on the mic, tell them what's inside these boxes. The model, you've got a model to recruit for the box. So, we're going to do a little. Uh, um, a charity auction um, at some point this evening, and um, uh, a few pairs of brand new Tom Ford. Oh, that's, that's the latest collection, Tom Ford. This is uh, one of the top-selling Tom Ford uh, cat eye. Um, Maybe you go upstairs. Oh, there, there you go, man. Back up here again. Flixie, Flixie. The latest ladies uh, Tom Ford sunglasses. So we've got a couple of these and then also a pair of Ray-Bans and uh, some more sort of... And now for those of you who want to look really cool in Hong Kong, <laughs> it goes very well with the Beats headsets. <laughs> this is the next Apple purchase, surround Oculus. Right. right. Is this guy? It's, it's, sorry, I don't need to. Yeah, so uh, Smith's uh, snowboarding uh, goggles, but uh, maybe a bit more applicable in the uh, mountains. Uh, Miyazaki, go to Japan. Or Korea. You can get that. Thank right. you. Thank Great job. So, we're going to auction these later, so if you're really mean, you can leave now. The spinning price is, what, 50? 50 dollars. And increments of 20. And we're going to give the money to Orbis because it's connected to your arts. So let's get started, mate. Okay. So David and I have already done this once today, but in a rather more formal environment. It was a conference over in the HKCEC about retail, it's called the Omnichannel Retailing Conference, which in non-jargon means how the hell does a brand sell online? So I had David talking from the online perspective and Hugo Boss talking from the offline perspective. Hugo Boss were a bit scared to come into Wanchai, so we only got David. I'm sorry. So that's, David's an interesting character. He, um, he's going to tell you a bit about himself. Where did you start your business? How did you start your business? Are you Australian? Are you yeah, Hong Kong? I'm from Australia originally. I was actually living in Europe before coming to Hong Kong. But um, when we started the business, we, we came to Hong Kong to start the business uh, for you know, the, the reasons that Hong Kong is uh, renowned. You know, the ease with which you can set up a company, uh, logistics, and you know, a number of other reasons. For so wait, wait, wait. Why did you start? What were you doing? You, you like glasses? What happened? You, you were cool? You were, I know you weren't cool, uh, but you were super no, cool. Really, uh, Entrepreneur, you know, um, like many of you here today, in that, like, um, you know, working in different capacity. I was in Europe, I just finished a, an MBA and a Master's of Political Science. Wait, 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 there's a few people here who finished an MBA. Anybody finished an MBA in this room? Yes. Peter, anybody else done an MBA? Yeah. Further studies. So I expect really good questions of from course. you. Of course. Of course. Further, further studies is great. I mean, I encourage uh, education even in the company. Um, but um, obviously it depends on an individual how you use that. Um, is it for like career development or um, is it to set up a business, right? Because uh, each is uh, based on the individual. In terms of myself, I was uh, more entrepreneurial rooted uh, throughout, you know. Isn't that a contradiction, MBA entrepreneurial? 
No, it's, no, no, because I mean, like, when I was in Sydney, all my friends were like, you know, getting jobs in banks and like, you know, building their careers. And you know, whilst I, I was working in a bank at that time, I, I sheared away from that. You know, I, I had an adversity to getting stuck in some sort of corporate um, rat race. So, um, an MBA or a master's is, is a fabulous way to, you know, take some time out, you know, reconsider, work out where you are again. And then in the internet startup world, they call this pivoting. Yeah, pivot, yeah. Right? It's a nice way of saying I haven't got a fucking clue what I'm doing next, but I'll change. Sure. So, um, so I, I, I so didn't have an idea what I wanted to do. I went from Australia to Sweden, and I did a, and a master's and an MBA in Sweden. Um, in Stockholm? In Lund, in, in the south of Sweden. How's your, your Swedish? I, it's non-existent now. Uh, but, uh, it's a Svensk. Uh, it is a Svensk. But you know that's the beautiful thing about like the world is that there's so many opportunities, uh, education um, and otherwise, um, all over the place. Like in Europe, you know, there's volunteer opportunities. I mean, maybe not so much in Hong Kong because here it's about finance and business and whatnot. So when you come here, you, you sort of need to have like a bit more of a focus. Um, but sh sure, in Europe, you know, with unemployment being what it is now, there's so many opportunities. Okay, so you were doing MBA in Sweden, and you go, what the world needs is sunglasses. Well, what actually happened, you know, was... Um, Especially in Sweden. Yeah, well... Where the sun doesn't go down until midnight. Right? In the two months of summer that exists, sunglasses are very popular, you know, but like the other ten months, it's a bit, a bit of a... Yeah, it's grey. Yeah. It's very grey. But I mean, how the business actually started was, um, you know, I was doing a project in Europe, and um, I had one of my old friends from Australia um, come in to help manage the project, and he'd just been living in Shanghai. Um, one of his um, friends, um, was a Chinese guy um, from Shanghai, and one of his friends from university had set up an online glasses business, right? So in China, selling discount glasses, um, you know, $9.95, $29.95, the discount range in China, right? It's like, you know, it's that cheap sort of product range. So the idea came from that, but then, as with every idea, it's not about like a, a pure duplication of the idea. That, that was the idea, and we, you know, Daron, my partner, who, you know, and Tony, you know, they shared that idea, and then we started thinking, glasses online, you know? And so when was this, give some time this to is, go? Um, this is in like a June, July 2006, it's the World okay. Cup. We had a project at the World Cup, which is in Germany, Germany 2006. Yeah, now it's uh, 2000, Brazil, you know, um, okay. Eight, 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 eight years later, eight years later, right? Two more World Cups later. So it was in 2006, and um, yeah, we're in Germany, and like we're talking about glasses online in China. Um, but we were Australians. I like that. You're Australians in Germany talking about glasses online, because Germans don't know what else to talk about, right? Napoleon's <laughs> 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 uh, interest in German characters. Uh, um, no, but um, yeah, so we're in Germany, and like, um, but you know, like we always um, bring experiences that we come across in life, and we we uh, we think about our own you know, history, our background. We thought about Australia, and uh, at that point in time, uh, as with now in Australia, um, the, the e-commerce players were limited. Okay, and this is something we can all see today. The U.S. is an adva advanced uh, e-commerce market, right? There's a lot of dot coms, right? But how many of those dot com businesses are now localized in, you know, whether it's Hong Kong or Sweden or Singapore or wherever else? And that's the real opportunity, you know, that there's always first movers in a certain market. Right, mate, so go back, you're jumping. I want to, so you, you were in Germany, you go, the world needs glasses. Well, we, and then what happens? Well, we looked at the market, we, we, we thought about it a little bit, as you do with any idea, any business idea you discuss with your friends. And with this business idea, we thought, okay, well, glasses, okay, is the market selling 995 or 1095 glasses online? Yes, that, that market exists, and it still exists today, because the factories in Shenzhen, they produce the glasses to a couple of dollars a piece, maybe five dollars, ten dollars, lenses, and how much are they being sold in, in shops for these days? It's ridiculous, right? Um, so that cheap market exists. But we also saw in Australia that the branded glasses, I'm talking about Prada, Gucci, Dior, and so forth, these products, they were not sold as discount. If anything, um, glasses are sold in retailers, they're heavily controlled. It's a monopoly in industry in, the, in, in that one, one or two companies, in Italian companies, the biggest on the Italian stock exchange, Laxonica. You know, Laxonica owns uh, the light brand band, Oakley. They own the licenses, they have a license for about 60 brands. So even though you're in a retail store, 
and you're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm buying these different branded eyewear pieces. They're all coming from effectively one company, Luxotica, and that's licensing. You know, that's that's fashion. That's licensing. And so you're saying it was a, it was an oligopoly of various companies who ran the business. It still is today. Okay. Um, and these parties are the ones that are um, pushing the prices up to the prices where we're seeing, you know, glasses, sunglasses are being sold at 400 US dollars, you know. Um, and that's the standard price they take for Bulgari's, you know, some Versace. Okay, one. so I want to go back historically. So you're in there. What happens then? Do you set up a website in China? No, do you go back to Australia? How, how, how do you grow, you know, from so, a, the, the, a business on a piece of German napkin? How does that become, you know, a website in Australia? Yeah, so the idea was developing. We're thinking, okay, is the market, is it eyeglasses discount or is it branded eyewear? What is the opportunity here? And in Australia at the time, um, if you wanted to buy branded eyewear, like a Ray-Ban, you'd have to go either to a retail store, physical, or to a dot com. Right? And that's still the same today in Hong Kong. If you want to buy branded eyewear in Hong Kong today, it's either the re retail store or a dot com, or um, my website, which is the dot com dot hk, in Cantonese, Mandarin, and English. Okay. All right. So you mean you're, you're slagging off dot coms? I'm, I'm, I'm because dot coms are like basically you're saying a dot com in your mind represents a brand dot com. What I'm presenting is that like in the USA, which is one big market with like oh, 300, okay. 350 million people. The e-commerce market is much more developed than in Hong Kong or other parts so of the world. So you decided in Germany, we're not going to compete in America. We'll go to all the other markets first. Is that the right idea? Well, that, that was the idea was initially to serve the Australian market, which is a market that we were comfortable with, we knew about it, and we could see very clearly the opportunity from day one. And I think that's the same with any business idea. You need to identify clearly what is that opportunity. And there was nobody else doing that in... There was like maybe one or two other small players at the time, but then you evaluate the competitors. What is the competitor landscape like? You know, who's in the landscape? Was it the eBay's? The people selling the eBay? Or? Well, that's how we started. In fact, you know, we, you know, we sort of okay, like we're branded eyewear. There's, there's a price arbitrage here between physical and online. Um, we spent a few months studying it, and then we realised, okay, let's see how this can work, and. The beautiful thing about with e-commerce, as opposed to like an app or all these other complex internet businesses, with e-commerce, you're selling a product, right? So you can build your own website, or you could sell a product on a platform, and that's what we did at the beginning. We started selling on eBay, you know, and it's very easy because you know you don't have to stress for six months about a platform and all that, you know, craziness. You know, you can learn step by step. So here we were with no idea about the internet at all. We had a business idea as entrepreneurs, and we're like, okay. It's fine, the model. So we, um, we identify the fact that on eBay, Bulgari's was selling for like $350, $400. Okay? And it was Bulgari sunglasses. In the retail stores, they were selling for $399. Okay? But on eBay, you know, there was, there was, you can see the, the, the transactions flowing through. So you can look at other competitors on eBay, right? And you can look at their, like, um, the reviews. So you can, and you can see the price that things sold for. So that's the beautiful thing about eBay, um, and also other platforms. You can already see, you can see the dynamics. The so you saw what was popular, what wasn't popular. Exactly. And said, right. On Gary. Exactly. We were able to come in for a high value good. We were able to um, acquire supply. So we were able to find a supplier in Europe, in that matter, um, who was able to provide us the product like one hundred and fifty dollars, whatever the cost price, wholesale price was, um, and then we were able to take the product. A listed for two ninety nine, thereby offering the customers a beautiful twenty five percent hundred dollar discount off the retail price. Um, yet we were still able to clear you know eighty dollars. So, so there you're arbitraging. Did you when you first started on eBay, were you called Smart Eyeglasses, or were you called like David Manning nineteen sixty two? In, in Australia, Pop? we were able. We we're fortunate that we got the brand name Vision Direct, um, and Good name. so we were able to, which is our name in Australia, and. We were really lucky because we, we were able to register the name before the Luxottica or the main like the main retail chain like the Lenscraft or the Sunglass Hut was able to get that name. And it was a very good name, Vision Direct. So we, we started with that name. We had our Vision Direct eBay store. Did, did Luxottica have? Why does Luxottica Luxottica sounds like something that you drink to go to the toilet? Right? <laughs> Italians. Italian. So did they were they using Vision Direct in other markets? 
in New Zealand they had a um, oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we took it in a... So you cyber squatted? A little bit. Um, no, no, not a little bit, yes. So it was a, a Australian yeah, mate. Right? It was an attractive brand name, you know, you yeah. can take an attractive brand name in a market, that's a great so, strategy. So right? how, long, how long were you on eBay before you decided, right, we've got to set up our own Yeah, shop? so we, we listed the product, we started making sales, you know, like 10 sales, five minutes start with the first sale, the second sale, you know, 10 sales a week. But were you were you promoting it a lot, or was it just people coming and searching on eBay? Were you... No, it was it was purely like the, the the way that eBay works, as well as other platforms like Amazon, is that like there there is the audience, there already is the customers inside those platforms searching. You can look in eBay today or Amazon. You can actually define keywords. You can work out how many people are searching for certain products, and then you can also see who's selling them. Right. So it's very easy then to say, okay, well if I can sell the product. Uh, at a better price, I should be able to take some of that volume from the other competitors who are selling the product. And, and that's the thing. So what you were saying from the early days, you were already kind of looking at the data, right? You were looking at competitor data, you were looking at keyword data. You were Certainly at... a little bit. So because at the end of the day, you, you, you can have a product, but you need to determine is there a market for this product? Um, and then, then it comes and, you know, goes together, supply and demand. But how did you do with all the logistics stuff? When there was an order, did you like kind of send an email to your supplier in... in pretty much, pretty much, pretty much. Back-to-back back to back orders, and that's how we were also able to develop the business um, from a cash flow positive standpoint. So I actually never... So you had no come on, no angel money or anything like that? Well, I've, I've never actually invested... We've never invested any money in the business, to be honest. Um, which is quite brilliant. Because, uh, you know, normally people invest in a business, but that's again the beauty of um, an e-commerce business, is that you can cash flow the business such that the customers will pay for the product, and then if you can place a back-to-back -back order with your supplier and get an effective and very quick delivery of the good, then you can again, you can ship it. Right? You can but how does that work in a world where people want the product the next day, or, you know, maybe can, well, think, is there enough room in there for you to make the order and get it to I, I think there's still enough room. It's, in today's world, sure, okay, like, there's a lot of expectation about next day delivery and stuff for certain products, but I think there's still enough room in the market for people who have custom products. You know, I've got a friend in Australia that makes, like, linen nappies for babies, that sort of stuff. <laughs> and like, you know, it's like, it's a custom product, like organic linen, you know, cotton nappies or whatever, you know, they, they wash more or not. But, but the point is that if you can find a market, and you can identify that market, and then if you, if you can communicate, like, honestly, like even in Brazil today, for example, um, it's not next day delivery, right? Linen nappies in Brazil. With our website, our Brazilian website, we have a Brazilian website, it's not called Smart by Glass, it's called Oculus World, which is a, it means sunglass roll in Portuguese. Okay, we've had to localize into you know localization in certain markets where languages are. Okay, let's come at it. So so you're on eBay, and what happens? The the watershed moment. What happens? You go you know, right thing, now. I'm going to build my own website. You know, list, listing, learning, learning step by step, learning. You know, listing one product, list, add, adding more products. You know, we added more products, started selling more products. After a while selling on eBay, you know, you can get the hang of it, right? But then you have to make a decision. Do I want to be just an eBay seller or, or do I want to start building a website and a, a tangible company? You know, after a couple of months, we made that decision. Obviously, also the transaction costs are uh, part of that because eBay charges transaction costs. How much do they charge? What These days, I don't know, like, like 3 4 5%. Okay. Um, there's the PayPal costs. So I got to the point where you're like, this makes financial sense to have our own website. Absolutely, and also it's part of building a business as well, right? It's the step by step um, of building a brand or building a business. So, so you, so you then built a site, Correct. still targeting Australians. That's right. We've under Vision Direct. That's exactly right. And then, when does that then transition into, you know, Hong Kong, well, Brazil, whatever? In the very happen? beginning, we, we built the company out of Hong Kong. So we didn't go to Australia to build Vision Direct. We built it out of Hong Kong, and. So I was in Europe before, and my partners were in Shanghai and Australia. The reason why we set up a Hong Kong website is because, um, you know, in different countries in the world have different regulatory rules for taxes and so forth. And at the end of the day, you know, there's a few markets in the world where you can go if you want to really build an e-commerce site. So you can go to the USA, which is one big market, very competitive now, but, you know, it's one big market. You can go to Europe. And then you're inside a customs union, you know, with a good population. 
or you can go to Asia. And because we wanted to push into Australia initially, it made sense to go to um, somewhere in Asia. Somewhere in Asia where you can develop a back office of good, efficient business infrastructure. Victor! Victor! Oi, Victor! Shh! We can't hear. I, I can hear you all the way from here. So it's a bit rude. Otherwise, I'm not going to come to your venue. Blackmail. Oh, sorry, carry on. So, He's being rude. Don't worry. So we, we, um, He's the famous blogger, Hong Kong Fooey. And that guy <laughs> is Hong Kong Fooey blog. Do you still blog under Hong Kong Fooey, Victor? No. That's why you're so loud. Start blogging again. So you get out of the system. <laughs> sorry, carry on. So the beautiful thing is that if you want to set up a business in Asia, you know, Hong Kong and Singapore, I mean, probably the two best places to ease of setting up a business. But isn't that, when you get into delivering products, I thought a lot of reasons that people set up e-commerce businesses in Hong Kong is that the cost of sending something from Hong Kong. I remember somebody telling me it was cheaper to send the, the CD Wow guys. You know CD Wow? Yeah. Absolutely. There used to be a very big e-commerce company in Hong Kong called CD Wow selling CDs in the UK, but they didn't tell anybody in the UK they were in Hong Kong. What they used to do, because the price of selling a CD from Hong Kong to, to say the East Coast of America was cheaper than selling it from San Francisco to the East Coast, they did all the distribution from here, right? And they had little old biddies who would go and get a product and put it in a bag and send it, a bit like you, right? The logistics is great out of Hong Kong, there's no question about that. And there's also um, a lot of tax advantages a lot of Hong Kong players dodge tax globally by like shipping undervalued, um, which is popular in Hong Kong. Um, we, we ship it. Can you explain what does that mean, shipping undervalued? It means when you fill in the form, you go 200, no, 20. Correct. Um, correct. So you lie. There's a hell of a. Um, I'm lying. Yes, correct. <laughs> so, as mentioned, uh, you should be. You, obviously, they told you this in your MBA. Never answer a question directly, <laughs> always make it sound. Um, as mentioned, we're proud that we were able to ship at full value. Okay. Um, so, so you you had a, a you, so you have a distribution center in Hong Kong. Correct. So where where in Hong Kong? Well, it started out of my bedroom. And, um, so you had a, you had big old biddies in your bedroom doing it. Or was it your... Well, what happened at the beginning was that you know we make our Bulgari sales in Australia on eBay. You know we place the order of the supplier. The supplier would courier me the box of goods. You know I open the box. I individually label the packages and um, you know, go to the post office and dispatch them and you know, out, out they went and you know, to the customers in Australia. Right. So um, you know, thankfully now we've developed uh, efficiencies. You know, we've got about 30 people in the logistics team. So you now have an office in Kennedy Town, right? That's correct. So you've got a warehouse there that you're doing all your distribution. Is that global distribution from Kennedy Town? It's, it's, it's for the Asia Pacific region. So, you know, we can do overnight courier into Australia, into New Zealand, all these countries around here. The price of the courier for the Asia Pacific region from Hong Kong is only tangibly different to within a country. You know, like, if you were in Sydney, in Australia, and you wanted to send to Melbourne, that would cost you like five, six dollars, you know, four to six dollars. For us to send to the customer in Australia, it's probably about seven, eight dollars. $8 is about like um, 70 Hong Kong, that's about $10. So, okay, so you're in Australia, Vision Direct, you get your own website. At what stage do you go, right, we're going to go global? Well, what happens? Well, you know, Did you make so much money you thought we can... Well, what happens? What makes you decide to go global without going to a venture capitalist or, or somebody with a lot of money that wants to back you? I think that um, in Hong Kong, there's a lot of good reasons about Hong Kong in terms of like some of the things we talked about, but the e-commerce market for Hong Kong itself is quite limited. Let's face it, the English population, you know, there's 100,000 people or something here. You know, and so we had an Australian website that was going well, um, but then we realized, hang on a second, we're in Hong Kong, wouldn't it make sense to also have a website in New Zealand or the UK or the USA, you know, other English markets? You know, what's the complexity? Once you have a website in one English market, to building a website in another English market, it's you know it's not that much, that complex actually. But do you do you have to host it in that market? Because in those days, cloud was a bit new, right? Well, I think hosting is still central. It's done centrally. It's like wherever you, you get your servers and you outsource your set servers to whoever. Um, but it's, it's more about like taking your database, okay, and then like just duplicating your database or, or building another front end off your database. And at the beginning, you can just copy the front end, but then you've got to realize that. Okay, so, but were you offering different products in different markets? 
Once you start going back to the UK, where you were buying from, where was the arbitrage? I don't understand, you don't have, there's no price difference in it. Well, the, the point is that like, still over time, it's about the competitor landscape. So in Australia, there was one competitor landscape. In the UK, in South Africa, in New Zealand, all these markets have their own competitor landscapes. Some people prefer to buy in their local country, in the local domain. Other people are comfortable to buy on a .com.